The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 11 Quote, Cursed be my tribe if I forgive him. Unquote. Shylock The Indian had selected for this desirable purpose one of those steep pyramidal hills which bear a strong resemblance to artificial mounds, and which so frequently occur in the valleys of America. The one in question was high and precipitous, its top flattened as usual, but with one of its sides more than ordinarily irregular. It possessed no other apparent advantage for a resting place than in its elevation and form, which might render defense easy and surprise nearly impossible. As Hayward, however, no longer expected that rescue which time and distance now rendered so improbable, he regarded these little peculiarities with an eye devoid of interest, devoting himself entirely to the comfort and condolence of his feebler companions. The Narragansetts were suffered to browse on the branches of the trees and shrubs that were thinly scattered over the summit of the hill, while the remains of the provisions were spread under the shade of a beech that stretched its horizontal limbs like a canopy above them. Notwithstanding the swiftness of their flight, one of the Indians had found an opportunity to strike a straggling fawn with an arrow, and had borne the more preferable fragments of the victim patiently on his shoulders to the stopping place. Without any aid from the science of cookery, he was immediately employed, in common with his fellows, in gorging himself with this digestible sustenance. Magua alone sat apart without participating in the revolting meal, and apparently buried in the deepest thought. This abstinence, so remarkable in an Indian, when he possessed the means of satisfying hunger, at length attracted the notice of Hayward. The young man willingly believed that the Huron deliberated on the most eligible manner of eluding the vigilance of his associates. With a view to assist his plans by any suggestion of his own, and to strengthen the temptation, he left the beach, and straggled, as if without an object, to the spot where Le Renard was seated. "'Has not Magua kept the sun in his face long enough to escape all danger from the Canadians?' he asked as though no longer doubtful of the good intelligence established between them. And will not the chief of William Henry be better pleased to see his daughters, before another knight may have hardened his heart to their loss, to make him less liberal in his reward? Do the pale faces love their children less in the morning than at night? asked the Indian coldly. By no means, returned Hayward, anxious to recall his heir, if he had made one. The white man may, and does often, forget the burial place of his fathers. He sometimes ceases to remember those he should love, and is promised to cherish. But the affection of a parent for his child is never permitted to die. And is the heart of the white-headed chief soft? And will he think of the babes that his squaws have given him? He is hard on his warriors, and his eyes are made of stone. He is severe to the idle and wicked, but to the sober and deserving he is a leader, both just and humane. I have known many fond and tender parents, but never have I seen a man whose heart was softer toward his child. You have seen the gray head in front of his warriors, Makwa, but I have seen his eyes swimming in water when he spoke of those children who are now in your power. Hayward paused, for he knew not how to construe the remarkable expression that gleamed across the swarthy features of the attentive Indian. At first it seemed as if the remembrance of the promised reward grew vivid in his mind, while he listened to the sources of parental feeling which were to assure its possession. But, as Duncan proceeded, the expression of joy became so fiercely malignant that it was impossible not to apprehend it proceeded from some passion more sinister than avarice. Go, said the Huron, suppressing the alarming exhibition in an instant, in a death-like calmness of countenance. Go to the dark-haired daughter and say, Maka wants to speak. 
the father will remember what the child promises. Duncan, who interpreted this speech to express a wish for some additional pledge that the promised gifts should not be withheld, slowly and reluctantly repaired to the place where the sisters were now resting from their fatigue, to communicate its purport to Cora. "'You understand the nature of an Indian's wishes,' he concluded, as he led her toward the place where she was expected, "'and must be prodigal of your offers of powder and blankets. Ardent spirits are, however, the most prized by such as he, nor would it be amiss to add some boon from your own hand, with that grace you so well know how to practice. Remember, Cora, that on your presence of mind and ingenuity, even your life, as well as that of Alice, may in some measure depend. Hayward, and yours! Mine is of little moment. It is already sold to my king, and is a prize to be seized by any enemy who may possess the power. I have no father to expect me, and but few friends to lament a fate which I have courted with the insatiable longings of youth after distinction. But hush, we approach the Indian. Makwa, the lady with whom you wish to speak, is here. The Indian rose slowly from his seat, and stood for near a minute silent and motionless. He then signed with his hand for Hayward to retire, saying coldly, When the Huron talks to the women, his tribe shut their ears. Duncan still lingering, as if refusing to comply. Cora said with a calm smile, You hear, Hayward, and delicacy at least should urge you to retire. Go to Alice, and comfort her with our reviving prospects. She waited until he had departed, and then, turning to the native, with a dignity of her sex in her voice and manner, she added, "'What would Le Renard say to the daughter of Monroe?' "'Listen,' said the Indian, laying his hand firmly upon her arm, as if willing to draw her utmost attention to his words, a movement that Cora as firmly but quietly repulsed by extricating the limb from his grasp. Makwa was born a chief and a warrior among the Red Hurons of the Lakes. He saw the sons of twenty summers make the snows of twenty winters run off in the streams before he saw a pale face, and he was happy. Then his Canadian fathers came into the woods and taught him to drink the fire water, and he became a rascal. The Hurons drove him from the graves of his fathers as they would chase the hunted buffalo. He ran down the shores of the lakes, and followed their outlet to the city of Cannon. There he hunted and fished, till the people chased him again through the woods into the arms of his enemies. The chief, who was born a Huron, was at last a warrior among the Mohawks. Something like this I had heard before, said Cora observing that he paused to suppress those passions which began to burn with too bright a flame, as he recalled the recollection of his supposed injuries. Was it the fault of Le Renard that his head was not made of rock? Who gave him the fire-water? Who made him a villain? T'was the pale faces, the people of your own color. Am I answerable that thoughtless and unprincipled men exist? "'Whose shades of countenance may resemble mine?' Cora calmly demanded of the excited savage. "'No. Makwa is a man, and not a fool. "'Such as you never opened their lips to the burning stream. "'The Great Spirit has given you wisdom.' "'What, then, have I to do or say in the matter of your misfortunes? "'Not to say of your errors?' Listen, repeated the Indian, resuming his earnest attitude. When his English and French fathers dug up the hatchet, Le Renard struck the war-post of the Mohawks, and went out against his own nation. The pale faces have driven the redskins from their hunting grounds, and now, when they fight, a white man leads the way. 
The old chief at Horican, your father, was the great captain of our war party. He said to the Mohawks, Do this and do that. And he was minded. He made a law that if an Indian swallowed the fire water and came into the cloth wigwams of his warriors, it should not be forgotten. Maqua Foolish opened his mouth, and the hot liquor led him into the cabin of Monroe. What did the gray head let his daughter say? He forgot not his words and did justice by punishing the offender, said the undaunted daughter. Justice, repeated the Indian, casting an oblique glance of the most ferocious expression at her unyielding countenance. Is it justice to make evil and then punish for it? Makwa was not himself. It was the fire-water that spoke and acted for him. But Monroe did believe it. The Yaron chief was tied up before all the pale-faced warriors and whipped like a dog. Cora remained silent, for she knew not how to palliate this imprudent severity on the part of her father in a manner to suit the comprehension of an Indian. See, continued Maqua, tearing aside the slight calico that very imperfectly concealed his painted breast. Here are scars, given by knives and bullets. Of these a warrior may boast before his nation. But the gray head has left marks on the back of the Huron chief, that he must hide like a squaw under this painted cloth of the whites. I had thought— resumed Cora, that an Indian warrior was patient, and that his spirit felt not, and knew not the pain his body suffered. When the Chippewas tied Maqua to the stake, and cut this gash, said the other, laying his finger on a deep scar, the Huron laughed in their faces, and told them, Women struck so light. His spirit was then in the clouds. But when he felt the blows of Monroe, his spirit lay under the perch. The spirit of a Huron is never drunk. It remembers forever. But it may be appeased. If my father has done you this injustice, show him how an Indian can forgive an injury and take back his daughters. You have heard from Major Hayward. Maqua shook his head, forbidding the repetition of offers he so much despised. "'What would you have?' continued Cora, after a most painful pause, while the conviction forced itself on her mind that the too sanguine and generous Duncan had been cruelly deceived by the cunning savage. "'What a Huron loves! Good for good! Bad for bad!' "'You would then—' Revenge the injury inflicted by Monroe on his helpless daughters? Would it not be more like a man to go before his face and take the satisfaction of a warrior? The arms of a pale face are long, and their knives sharp, returned the savage with a malignant laugh. Why should Le Renard go among the muskets of his warriors? when he holds the spirit of the gray head in his hand. "'Name your intention, Magua," said Cora, struggling with herself to speak with steady calmness. "'Is it to lead us prisoners to the woods, or do you contemplate some greater evil? Is there no reward, no means of palliating the injury, and of softening your heart? At least release my gentle sister.' and pour out your malice on me. Purchase wealth by her safety, and satisfy your revenge with a single victim. The loss of both his daughters might bring the aged man to his grave, and where would then be the satisfaction of Le Renard? Listen, said the Indian again. The light eyes go back to the hurricane and tell the old chief what has been done, if the dark-haired woman will swear by the great spirit of her fathers to tell no lie. "'What must I promise?' demanded Cora, 
still maintaining a secret ascendancy over the fierce native by the collected and feminine dignity of her presence. When Makwa left his people, his wife was given to another chief. He has now made friends with the Hurons, and will go back to the graves of his tribe on the shores of the great lake. Let the daughter of the English chief follow, and live in his wigwam forever. However revolting a proposal of such a character might prove to Cora, she retained, notwithstanding her powerful disgust, sufficient self-command to reply, without betraying the weakness. And what pleasure would Makwa find in sharing his cabin with a wife he did not love, one who would be of a nation and color different from his own? It would be better to take the gold of Monroe, and buy the heart of some Huron maid with his gifts. The Indian made no reply for near a minute, but bent his fierce looks on the countenance of Cora in such wavering glances that her eye sank with shame under an impression that for the first time they had encountered an expression that no chaste female might endure. While she was shrinking within herself, in dread of having her ears wounded by some proposal still more shocking than the last, the voice of Makwa answered, in its tones of deepest malignancy, When the blows scorched the back of the Huron, he would know where to find a woman to fill the smart. The daughter of Monroe would draw his water, hoe his corn, and cook his venison. The body of the gray head would sleep among his cannon, but his heart would lie within reach of the knife of Le Subtil. Monster! Well does thou deserve thy treacherous name, cried Cora in an ungovernable burst of filial indignation. None but a fiend could mediate such a vengeance, but thou overratest thy power. You shall find it is, in truth, the heart of Monroe you hold, and that it will defy your utmost malice. The Indian answered this bold defiance by a ghastly smile that showed an unaltered purpose, while he motioned her away, as if to close the conference forever. Cora, already regretting her precipitation, was obliged to comply, for Maqua instantly left the spot and approached his gluttonous comrades. Hayward flew to the side of the agitated female, and demanded the result of a dialogue that he had watched at a distance, with so much interest. But unwilling to alarm the fears of Alice, she evaded a direct reply, betraying only by her anxious looks fastened on the slightest movements of her captors. To the reiterated and earnest questions of her sister concerning their probable destination, she made no other answer than by pointing toward the dark group, with an agitation she could not control, and murmuring as she folded Alice to her bosom, "'There, there! Read our fortunes in their faces! We shall see! We shall see!' The action and the choked utterance of Cora spoke more impressively than any words, and quickly drew the attention of her companions on that spot where her own was riveted with an intenseness that nothing but the importance of the stake could create. When Mako reached the cluster of lolling savages, who, gorged with their disgusting meal, lay stretched on the earth in brutal indulgence, he commenced speaking with the dignity of an Indian chief. The first syllables he uttered had the effect to cause his listeners to raise themselves in attitudes of respectful attention. As the Huron used his native language, the prisoners, notwithstanding the caution of the natives had kept them within swing of their tomahawks, could only conjecture the substance of his harangue from the nature of those significant gestures with which an Indian always illustrates his eloquence. At first, the language as well as the action of Makwa appeared calm and deliberative. When he had succeeded in sufficiently awakening the attention of his comrades, Hayward fancied, by his pointing so frequently toward the direction of the Great Lakes, 
that he spoke of the land of their fathers, and of their distant tribe. Frequent indications of applause escaped the listeners, who, as they uttered the expressive, oh, looked at each other, in commendation to the speaker. Le Renard was too skillful to neglect his advantage. He now spoke of the long and painful route by which they had left those spacious grounds and happy villages, to come in battle against the enemies of their Canadian fathers. He enumerated the warriors of the party, their several merits, their frequent services to the nation, their wounds, the number of scalps they had taken. Whenever he alluded to any present, and the subtle Indian neglected none, the dark countenance of the flattered individual gleamed with exultation. Nor did he even hesitate to assert the truth of the words, by gestures of applause and confirmation. Then the voice of the speaker fell, and lost the loud animated tones of triumph, with which he had enumerated their deeds of success and victory. He described the cataract of glens, the impregnable position of its rocky island, with its caverns, and its numerous rapids and whirlpools. He named the name of La Longue Carabine, and paused until the forest beneath them had sent up the last echo of a loud and long yell, with which the hated appellation was received. He pointed toward the youthful military captive, and described the death of a favorite warrior, who had been precipitated into the deep ravine by his hand. He not only mentioned the fate of him who, hanging between heaven and earth, had presented such a spectacle of horror to the whole band, but he acted anew the terrors of his situation, his resolution, and his death on the branches of a sapling. And, finally, he rapidly recounted the manner in which each of their friends had fallen, never failing to touch upon their courage and their most acknowledged virtues. When this recital of events was ended, his voice once more changed, and became plaintive and even musical in its low guttural sounds. He now spoke of the wives and children of the slain, their destitution, their misery, both physical and moral, their distance, and at last of their unavenged wrongs. Then. Suddenly lifting his voice to a pitch of terrific energy, he concluded by demanding, Are the Hurons dogs to bear this? Who shall say to the wife in Manoqua that the fishes have his scalp, and that his nation have not taken revenge? Who will dare meet the mother of Wasatimi, that scornful woman, with his hands clean? What shall be said to the old men when they ask us for scalps? and we have not a hair from a white head to give him. The women will point their fingers at us. There's a dark spot on the name of the Hurons, and it must be hid in blood. His voice was no longer audible in the burst of rage which now broke into the air, as if the wood, instead of containing so small a band, was filled with the nation. During the foregoing address, the progress of the speaker was too plainly read by those most interested in his success through the medium of the countenances of the men he addressed. They had answered his melancholy and mourning by sympathy and sorrow, his assertions by gestures of confirmation, and his boasting with the exultation of savages. When he spoke of courage, their looks were firm and responsive. When he alluded to their injuries, their eyes kindled with fury when he mentioned the taunts of the women. They dropped their heads in shame, but when he pointed out their means of vengeance, he struck a chord which never failed to thrill in the breast of an Indian, with the first intimation that it was within their reach. The whole band sprang upon their feet as one man giving utterance to their rage in the most frantic cries. They rushed upon their prisoners in a body with drawn knives and uplifted tomahawks. Hayward threw himself between the sisters and the foremost, whom he grappled with a desperate strength that for a moment checked his violence. The unexpected resistance gave Maqua time to interpose, 
and with rapid enunciation and animated gesture, he drew the attention of the band again to himself. In that language he knew so well how to assume, he diverted his comrades from their instant purpose, and invited them to prolong the misery of their victims. His proposal was received with acclamations, and executed with the swiftness of thought. Two powerful warriors cast themselves on Hayward, while another was occupied in securing the less active singing master. Neither of the captives, however, submitted without a desperate, though fruitless, struggle. Even David hurled his assailant to the earth, nor was Hayward secured until the victory over his companion enabled the Indians to direct their united force on that object. He was then bound and fastened to the body of the sapling, on whose branches Maqua had acted the pantomime of the falling Huron. When the young soldier regained his recollection, he had the painful certainty before his eyes that a common fate was intended for the whole party. On his right was Cora, in a durance similar to his own, pale and agitated, but with an eye whose steady look still read the proceedings of their enemies. On his left, the wives which bound her to a pine performed that office for Alice, which her trembling limbs refused, and alone kept her fragile form from sinking. Her hands were clasped before her in prayer, but instead of looking upward toward the power which alone could rescue them, her unconscious looks wandered to the countenance of Duncan with infantile dependency. David had contended, and the novelty of the circumstance held him silent in deliberation of the propriety of the unusual occurrence. The vengeance of the Hurons had now taken a new direction, and they prepared to execute it with that barbarous ingenuity with which they were familiarized by the practice of centuries. Some sought knots to raise the blazing pile, one was riving the splinters of pine, in order to pierce the flesh of their captives with the burning fragments, and others bent the tops of two samplings to the earth, in order to suspend Hayward by the arms between the recoiling branches. But the vengeance of Maqua sought a deeper and more malignant enjoyment. While the less refined monsters of the band prepared before the eyes of those who were to suffer those well-known and vulgar means of torture, he approached Cora, and pointed out, with the most malign expression of countenance, the speedy fate that awaited her. Ha! he added, what says the daughter of Monroe? Her head is too good to find a pillow in the wigwam of Le Renard. Will she like it better, when it rolls about this hill, a plaything for the wolves? Her bosom cannot nurse the children of a Huron. She will see it spit upon by Indians. What means the monster? demanded the astonished Hayward. Nothing, was the firm reply. He is a savage, a barbarous and ignorant savage, and knows not what he does. Let us find leisure with our dying breath to ask for him penitence and pardon. Pardon, echoed the fierce Huron mistaking in his anger the meaning of her words. The memory of an Indian is no longer than the arm of the pale-faces, his mercy shorter than their justice. Say, shall I send the yellow hair to her father, and will you follow Maqua to the great lakes to carry his water and feed him with corn? Cora beckoned him away, with an emotion of disgust she could not control. Leave me, she said, with a solemnity that for a moment checked the barbarity of the Indian. You mingle bitterness with my prayers. You stand between me and my God. The slight impression produced on the savage was, however, soon forgotten, and he continued, pointing with taunting irony toward Alice. Look, the child weeps. She's too young to die. Send her to Monroe to comb his gray hairs and keep life in the heart of the old man. Cora could not resist the desire to look upon her youthful sister, in whose eyes she met an imploring glance that betrayed the longings of nature. What says he, dearest Cora? 
asked the trembling voice of Alice. "'Did he speak of sending me to our father?' For many moments the elder sister looked upon the younger, with a countenance that wavered with powerful and contending emotions. At length she spoke, though her tones had lost their rich and calm fullness, in an expression of tenderness that seemed maternal. Alice, she said, the Huron offers us both life. Nay, more than both. He offers to restore Duncan, our invaluable Duncan, as well as you to our friends, to our father, to our heart-stricken, childless father. If I will bow down this rebellious, stubborn pride of mine, and consent— Her voice became choked, and clasping her hands she looked upward, as if seeking, in her agony, intelligence from a wisdom that was infinite. "'Say on!' cried Alice. "'To what, dearest Cora? Oh, that the proffer were made to me, to save you, to cheer our aged father, to restore Duncan. How cheerfully would I die! Die, repeated Cora, with a calmer and firmer voice. That were easy. Perhaps the alternative may not be less so. He would have me, she continued, her accents sinking under a deep consciousness of the degradation of the proposal. Follow him to the wilderness. Go to the habitations of the Hurons. To remain there. In short, to become his wife. Speak then, Alice, child of my affections, sister of my love. And you too, Major Hayward, aid my weak reason with your counsel. Is life to be purchased by such a sacrifice? Will you, Alice, receive it at my hands at such a price? And you, Duncan, guide me, control me between you, for I am wholly yours. Would I? echoed the indignant and astonished youth. Cora, Cora, you jest with our misery. Name not the horrid alternative again. The thought itself is worse than a thousand deaths. "'That such would be your answer I well knew!' exclaimed Cora, her cheeks flushing, and her dark eyes once more sparkling with the lingering emotions of a woman. "'What says my Alice? For her I will submit without another murmur.' Although both Hayward and Cora listened with painful suspense, and the deepest attention, no sounds were heard in reply. It appeared as if the delicate and sensitive form of Alice would shrink into itself as she listened to this proposal. Her arms had fallen lengthwise before her, the fingers moving in slight convulsions, her head dropped upon her bosom, and her whole person seemed suspended against the tree, looking like some beautiful emblem of the wounded delicacy of her sex. Devoid of animation, and yet keenly conscious. In a few moments, however, her head began to move slowly, in a deep sign of unconquerable disapprobation. No, no, no! Better that we die as we have lived, together! Then die! shouted Maqua, hurling his tomahawk with violence at the unresisting speaker, and gnashing his teeth with a rage that could no longer be bridled at this sudden exhibition of firmness in the one he believed the weakest of the party. The axe cleaved the air in front of Hayward, and cutting some of the flowing ringlets of Alice, quivered in the tree above her head. The sight maddened Duncan to desperation. Collecting all his energies in one effort, he snapped the twigs which bound him, and rushed upon another savage, who was preparing, with loud yells and a more deliberate aim, to repeat the blow. They encountered, grappled, and fell to the earth together. The naked body of his antagonist afforded Hayward no means of holding his adversary, who glided from his grasp, and rose again with one knee on his chest, pressing him down with the weight of a giant. Duncan already saw the knife gleaming in the air, when a whistling sound swept past him, and was rather accompanying than followed by the sharp crack of a rifle. He felt his breast relieved from the load it had endured. 
he saw the savage expression of his adversary's countenance change to a look of vacant wildness, when the Indian fell dead on the faded leaves by his side. End of chapter 11 The Last of the Mohicans A Narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 12 Quote, Clo, I am gone, sire, and anon, sire, I'll be with you again. Unquote. From Twelfth Night. The Hurons stood aghast of this sudden visitation of death on one of their band, but as they regarded the fatal accuracy of an aim which had dared to immolate an enemy at so much hazard to a friend, the name of Le Long Carabine burst simultaneously from every lip, and was succeeded by a wild and sort of plaintive howl. The cry was answered by a loud shout from a little thicket, where the incautious party had piled their arms, and at the next moment Hawkeye, too eager to load the rifle he had regained, was seen advancing upon them, brandishing the clubbed weapon, and cutting the air with wide and powerful sweeps. Bold and rapid was the progress of the scout. It was exceeded by that of a light and vigorous form, which, bounding past him, leaped with incredible activity and daring into the very center of the Hurons, where it stood, whirling a tomahawk and flourishing a glittering knife, with fearful menaces in front of Cora. Quicker than the thoughts could follow those unexpected and audacious movements, an image, armed in the emblematic panoply of death, glided before their eyes, and assumed a threatening attitude at the other side. The savage tormentors recoiled before these warlike intruders, and uttered as they appeared in such quick succession the often repeated and peculiar exclamations of surprise, followed by the well-known and dreaded appellations of Les Serfagil! Les Gros Serpent! But the wary and vigilant leader of the Hurons was not so easily disconcerted. Casting his keen eyes around the little plain, he comprehended the nature of the assault at a glance, and encouraging his followers by his voice, as well as by his example, he unsheathed his long and dangerous knife, and rushed with a loud hoop upon the expected Chinchgachkok. It was the signal of a general combat. Neither party had firearms, and the contest was to be decided in the deadliest manner, hand to hand, with weapons of offense and none of defense. Uncas answered the hoop, and leaping on an enemy, with a single well-directed blow of his tomahawk, cleft him to the brain. Hayward tore the weapon of Maqua from the sapling, and rushed eagerly toward the fray. As the combatants were now equal in number, each singled an opponent from the adverse band. The rush and blows passed with the fury of a whirlwind, and the swiftness of lightning. Hawkeye soon got another enemy within reach of his arm, and with one sweep of his formidable weapon he beat down the slight and inartificial defenses of his antagonist, crushing him to earth with the blow. Hayward ventured to hurl the tomahawk he had seized too, ardent to await the moment of closing. It struck the Indian he had selected on the forehead, and checked for an instant his onward rush. Encouraged by this slight advantage, the impetuous young man continued his onset, and sprang upon his enemy with naked hands. A single instant was enough to assure him of the rashness of the measure, for he immediately found himself fully engaged, with all his activity and courage, in endeavoring to ward the desperate thrust made with the knife of the Huron. Unable longer to foil an enemy so alert and vigilant, he threw his arms about him, and succeeded in pinning the limbs of the other to his side, with an iron grasp, but one that was far too exhausting to himself to continue long. In this extremity he heard a voice near him shouting, Exterminate the varlets! No quarter to an accursed Mingo! At the next moment the breech of Hawkeye's rifle fell on the naked head of his adversary, whose muscles appeared to wither under the shock, as he sank from the arms of Duncan, flexible, and motionless. 
when Uncas had brained his first antagonist, he turned like a hungry lion to seek another. The fifth and only Huron disengaged at the first onset, had paused a moment, and then seeing that all around him were employed in the deadly strife, he had sought, with hellish vengeance, to complete the baffled work of revenge. Raising a shout of triumph, he sprang toward the defenseless Cora, sending his keen axe as the dreadful precursor of his approach. The tomahawk grazed her shoulder, and cutting the withes which bound her to the tree, left the maiden at liberty to fly. She eluded the grasp of the savage, and, reckless of her own safety, threw herself on the bosom of Alice, striving with convulsed and ill-directed fingers to tear asunder the twigs which confined the person of her sister. Any other than a monster would have relented at such an act of generous devotion to the best and purest affection. But the breast of the Huron was a stranger to sympathy. Seizing Cora by the rich tresses which fell in confusion about her form, he tore her from her frantic hold, and bowed her down with brutal violence to her knees. The savage drew the flowing curls through his hand, and raising them on high with an outstretched arm, he passed the knife around the exquisitely molded head of his victim, with a taunting and exulting laugh. But he purchased this moment of fierce gratification with the loss of the fatal opportunity. It was just then the sight caught the eye of Uncas. Bounding from his footsteps, he appeared for an instant darting through the air, and descending in a ball, he fell on the chest of his enemy, driving him many yards from the spot, headlong and prostrate. The violence of the exertion cast the young Mohican at his side. They arose together, fought, and bled, each in his turn. But the conflict was soon decided. The tomahawk of Hayward and the rifle of Hawkeye descended on the skull of the Huron at the same moment that the knife of Uncas reached his heart. The battle was now entirely terminated, with the exception of the protracted struggle between Le Renard Subtil and Le Gros Serpent. Well did these barbarous warriors prove that they deserved those significant names, which had been bestowed for deeds in former wars. When they engaged, some little time was lost in eluding the quick and vigorous thrust which had been aimed at their lives. Suddenly darting on each other, they closed and came to the earth, twisted together like twining serpents in pliant and subtle folds. At the moment when the victors found themselves unoccupied, the spot where these experienced and desperate combatants lay could only be distinguished by a cloud of dust and leaves, which moved from the center of the little plain toward its boundary, as if raised by the passage of a whirlwind. Urged by the different motives of filial affection, friendship, and gratitude, Hayward and his companions rushed with one accord to the place, encircling the little canopy of dust which hung above the warriors. In vain did Uncas dart around the cloud with a wish to strike his knife into the heart of his father's foe. The threatening rifle of Hawkeye was raised and suspended in vain while Duncan endeavored to seize the limbs of the Huron, with hands that had appeared to have lost their power. Covered as they were with dust and blood, the swift evolutions of the combatants seemed to incorporate their bodies into one. The death-like looking figure of the Mohican and the dark form of the Huron gleamed before their eyes in such quick and confused succession that the friends of the former knew not where to plant the succoring blow. It is true that there were short and fleeting moments when the fiery eyes of Mokwa were seen glittering like fabled organs of the basilisk through the dusty wreath by which he was enveloped, and he read by those short and deadly glances the fate of the combat in the presence of his enemies. Ere, however, any hostile hand that could descend on his devoted head, its place was filled by the scowling visage of Chingachgook. In this manner the scene of the combat was removed from the center of the little plain to its verge, though Mohican now found an opportunity to make a powerful thrust with his knife. Maqua suddenly relinquished his grasp, and fell backward without motion, and seemingly without life. His adversary leaped on his feet making the arches of the forest ring 
with the shouts of triumph. "'Well done for the Delawares! Victory to the Mohicans!' cried Hawkeye, once more elevating the butt of the long and fatal rifle. "'A finishing blow from a man without a cross will never tell against his honor, nor rob him of his right to the scalp.' But at the very moment when the dangerous weapon was in the act of descending, the subtle Huron rolled swiftly from beneath the danger, over the edge of the precipice, and falling on his feet, was seen leaping with a single bound into the center of a thicket of low bushes that clung along its sides. The Delawares, who had believed their enemy dead, uttered their exclamation of surprise, and were following with speed and clamor like hounds in open view of the deer, when a shrill and peculiar cry from the scout instantly changed their purpose, and recalled them to the summit of the hill. "'Twas like himself!' cried the inveterate forester, whose prejudice contributed so largely to veil his natural sense of justice in all matters which concerned the Mingos. "'A lying and deceitful varlet as he is!' An honest Delaware now, being fairly vanquished, would have lain still, and been knocked on the head. But these knavish maquas cling to life like so many cats of the mountain. Let him go, let him go. Tis but one man, and he without rifle or bow, many a long mile from his French comrades. And like a rattler that lost his fangs, he can do no further mischief until such time as he and we too may leave the prints of our moccasins over a long reach of sandy plain. See, Uncas, he added in Delaware, your father is flaying the scalps already. It may be well to go around and fill the vagabonds that are left, or we may have another of them loping through the woods, and screeching like a jay that has been winged. So saying, the honest but implacable scout made the circuit of the dead, into whose senseless bosoms he thrust his long knife, with as much coolness as though they had been so many brute carcasses. He had, however, been anticipated by the elder Mohican, who had already torn the emblems of victory from the unresisting heads of the slain. But Uncas, denying his habits, we had almost said his nature, flew with instinctive delicacy, accompanied by Hayward, to the assistance of the females, and quickly releasing Alice, placed her in the arms of Cora. We shall not attempt to describe the gratitude of the almighty disposer of events, which glowed in the bosoms of the sisters, who were thus unexpectedly restored to life and to each other. Their thanksgivings were deep and silent, the offerings of their gentle spirits burning brightest and purest, on the secret altars of their hearts, and their renovated and more earthly feelings exhibiting themselves in long and fervent, though speechless, caresses. As Alice rose from her knees, where she had sunk by the side of Cora, she threw herself on the bosom of the latter, and sobbed aloud the name of their aged father, while her soft and dove-like eyes sparkled with rays of hope. "'We are saved! We are saved!' she murmured. "'To return to the arms of our dear, dear father, "'and his heart will not be broken with grief. "'And you too, Cora, my sister, my more than sister, my mother, "'you too are spared. And Duncan,' she added, "'looking around upon the youth with a smile of ineffable innocence, "'even our own brave and noble Duncan has escaped without a hurt.' To these ardent and nearly innocent words, Cora made no other answer than by straining the youthful speaker to her heart as she bent over her in melting tenderness. The manhood of Hayward felt no shame in dropping tears over this spectacle of affectionate rapture, and Uncas stood, fresh and blood-stained from the combat, a calm and apparently an unmoved looker-on, it is true, but with eyes that had already lost their fierceness and which were beaming with a sympathy that elevated him far above the intelligence, and advanced him probably centuries before the practices of his nation. During this display of emotions, so natural in their situation, 
Hawkeye, whose vigilant distrust had satisfied itself that the Hurons who disfigured the heavenly scene no longer possessed the power to interrupt its harmony, approached David and liberated him from the bonds he had, until that moment, endured with the most exemplary patience. There, exclaimed the scout, casting the last wife behind him, you are once more master of your own limbs, though you seem not to use them with much greater judgment than that in which they were first fashioned. If advice from one who is not older than yourself, but who, having lived most of his time in the wilderness, may be said to have experience beyond his years, will give no offense, you are welcome to my thoughts, and these are, to part with the little tooting instrument in your jacket to the first fool you meet with, and buy some weapon with the money, if it only be the barrel of a horseman's pistol. By industry and care you might thus come to some preferment, for by this time, I should think, your eyes would plainly tell you that a carrion crow is a better bird than a mocking thresher. The one will at least remove foul sights from before the face of man, while the other is only good to brew disturbances in the woods, by cheating the ears of all that hear them. Arms and clarion for the battle, but the song of thanksgiving to the victory, answered the liberated David. Friend, he added, thrusting forth his lean, delicate hand toward Hawkeye, in kindness, while his eyes twinkled and grew moist, I thank thee that the hairs of my head still grow, where they first rooted by providence. For though those of other men may be more glossy and curling, I have ever found mine own well suited to the brain they shelter. That I did not join myself in the battle was less owing to disinclination than to the bonds of the heathen. Valiant and skilful hast thou proved thyself in the conflict, and I hereby thank thee, before proceeding to discharge other and more important duties, because thou hast proved thyself well worthy of a Christian's praise. The thing is but a trifle, and what you may often see if you tarry long among us, returned the scout, a good deal softened toward the man of song by this unequivocal expression of gratitude. I have got my old companion, Kildeer, he added, striking his hand on the breech of his rifle, and that in itself is a victory. These Iroquois are cunning, but they outwitted themselves when they placed their firearms out of reach. And, had Uncas or his father been gifted with only their common Indian patience, we should have come in upon the knaves with three bullets instead of one. And that would have made a finish of the whole pack, yon loping varlet, as well as his comrades. But twas all forwarded, and for the best. Thou sayest well, returned David, and hast caught the true spirit of Christianity. He that is to be saved will be saved and he that is predestined to be damned will be damned. This is the doctrine of truth, and most consoling and refreshing it is to the true believer. The scout, who by this time was seated, examining into the state of his rifle with a species of parental assiduity, now looked up at the other in a displeasure that he did not effect to conceal, roughly interrupting further speech. Doctrine or no doctrine, said the sturdy woodsman, tis the belief of knaves and the curse of an honest man. I can credit that yonder Huron was to fall by my hand, for with my own eyes I have seen it. But nothing, short of being a witness, will cause me to think he has met with any reward, or that Chingachcook there will be condemned at the final day. You have no warranty for such an audacious doctrine, nor any covenant to support it, cried David, who was deeply tinctured with the subtle distinctions which in his time, and more especially in his province, had been drawn around the beautiful simplicity of revelation, by endeavoring to penetrate the awful mystery of the divine nature, supplying faith 
by self-sufficiency, and by consequence involving those who reason from such human dogmas in absurdities and doubt. Your temple is reared on the sands, and the first tempest will wash away its foundation. I demand your authorities for such an uncharitable assertion. Like other advocates of a system, David was not always accurate in his use of terms. Name chapter and verse. In which of the holy books do you find language to support you? Book? repeated Hawkeye, with singular and ill-concealed disdain. Do you take me for a whimpering boy at the apron string of one of your old gals, and this good rifle on my knee for the feather of a goose's wing? My ox's horn for a bottle of ink, and my leathern pouch for a cross-barred handkerchief to carry my dinner? Book! What have such as I, who am a warrior of the wilderness, though a man without a cross, to do with books? I never read but in one, and the words that are written there are too simple and too plain to need much schooling, though I may boast that of forty long and hard-working years. "'What call you the volume?' said David, misconceiving the other's meaning. "'Tis open before your eyes,' returned the scout, "'and he who owns it is not a niggard of its use. "'I have heard it said that there are men who read in books "'to convince themselves there is a God. "'I know not but man may so deform his works in the settlement "'as to leave that which is so clear in the wilderness "'a matter of doubt among traders and priests.' If any such there be, and he will follow me from sun to sun through the windings of the forest, he shall see enough to teach him that he is a fool, and the greatest of his follies lies in striving to rise to the level of one he can never equal, be it in goodness or be it in power. The instant David discovered that he battled with a disputant who imbibed his faith from the lights of nature, eschewing all subtleties of doctrine, he willingly abandoned a controversy from which he believed neither profit nor credit was to be derived. While the scout was speaking, he had also seated himself, and producing the ready little volume and the iron-rimmed spectacles, he prepared to discharge a duty, which nothing but the unexpected assault he had received in his orthodoxy could have so long suspended. He was, in truth, a minstrel of the western continent, of a much later day, certainly than those gifted bards, who formerly sang the profane renown of baron and prince, but after the spirit of his own age and country, he was now prepared to exercise the cunning of his craft, in celebration of, or in rather thanksgiving of, the recent victory. He waited patiently for Hawkeye to cease. Then, lifting his eyes together with his voice, he said aloud, I invite you, friends, to join in praise for this signal deliverance from the hands of barbarians and infidels to the comfortable and solemn tones of the tune called Northampton. Next he named the page and verse where the rhymes selected were to be found, and applied the pitch-pipe to his lips, with the decent gravity that he had been wont to use in the temple. This time he was, however, without any accompaniment, for the sisters were just then pouring out those tender effusions of affections, which have already been alluded to. Nothing deterred by the smallness of his audience, which in truth consisted only of the discontented scout, he raised his voice, commencing and ending the sacred song without accident or interruption of any kind. Hawkeye listened while he coolly adjusted his flint and reloaded his rifle. But the sounds, wanting the extraneous assistance of scene and sympathy, failed to awaken his slumbering emotions. Never minstrel, or by whatever more suitable name David should be known, drew upon his talents in the presence of more insensible auditors though, considering the singleness and sincerity of his motive, it is probable that no bard of profane song ever uttered notes that ascended 
so near to that throne where all homage and praise is due. The scout shook his head, and muttering some unintelligible words, among which throat and Iroquois were alone audible, he walked away to collect and to examine into the state of the captured arsenal of the Hurons. In this office he was now joined by Chingachgook, who found his own as well as the rifle of his son among the arms. Even Hayward and David were furnished with weapons, nor was ammunition wanting to render them all effectual. When the foresters had made their selection, and distributed their prizes, the scout announced that the hour had arrived when it was necessary to move. By this time the song of Gamut had ceased, and the sisters had learned to still the exhibition of their emotions. Aided by Duncan and the younger Mohican, the two latter descended the precipitous sides of that hill which they had so lately ascended under so very different auspices, and whose summit had so nearly proved the scene of their massacre. At the foot they found the Narragansetts browsing the herbage of the bushes, and having mounted, they followed the movements of a guide, who in the most deadly straits had so often proved himself their friend. The journey was, however, short. Hawkeye, leaving the blind path that the Hurons had followed, turned short to his right, and entering the thicket, he crossed a babbling brook, and halted in a narrow dell, under the shade of a few water-elms. Their distance from the base of the fatal hill was but a few rods, and the steeds had been serviceable only in crossing the shallow stream. The scout and the Indians appeared to be familiar with the sequestered place, where they now were. For, leaning their rifle against the trees, they commenced throwing aside the dried leaves, and opening the blue clay out of which a clear and sparkling spring of bright glancing water quickly bubbled. The white men then looked about him as though seeking for some object, which was not to be found as readily as he expected. Them careless imps, the Mohawks, with their Tuscarora and Onondaga brethren, have been here slaking their thirst, he muttered, and the vagabonds have thrown away the gourd. This is the way with benefits, when they are bestowed on such dismembering hounds. Here has the Lord laid his hand in the midst of the howling wilderness for their good, and raised a fountain of water from the bowels of the earth, that might laugh at the richest shop of apothecaries where in all the colonies. And see, the knaves have trodden in the clay, and deformed the cleanliness of the place as though they were brute beasts instead of human men. Uncas silently extended toward him the desired gourd, which the spleen of Hawkeye had hitherto prevented him from observing on a branch of an elm. Filling it with water, he retired a short distance to a place where the ground was more firm and dry. Here he coolly seated himself, and after taking a long and apparently a grateful draught, he commenced a very strict examination of the fragments of food left by the Hurons, which had hung in a wallet on his arm. "'Thank you, lad,' he continued, returning the empty gourd to Uncas. "'Now we will see how these rampaging Hurons lived when outlying in ambushments. Look at this. The varlets know the better pieces of the deer, and one would think they might carve and roast a saddle equal to the best cook in the land. But everything is raw.' for the Iroquois are thorough savages. Uncas, take my steel, and kindle a fire. A mouthful of tender boil will give nature a helping hand, after so long a trail. Hayward, perceiving that their guides now set about their repast in sober earnest, assisted the ladies to alight, and placed himself at their side, not unwilling to enjoy a few moments of grateful rest after the bloody scene he had just gone through. While the culinary process was in hand, curiosity induced him to inquire into the circumstances which had led to their timely and unexpected rescue. "'How is it that we see you so soon, my generous friend?' he asked. "'And without aid from the garrison of Edward. Had we gone to the bend of the river, we might have been in time to rake the leaves over your bodies.' 
but too late to have saved your scalps, coolly answered the scout. No, no. Instead of throwing away strength and opportunity by crossing to the fort, we lay by under the bank of the Hudson, waiting to watch the movements of the Hurons. You were then witnesses of all that passed? Not of all, for Indian sight is too keen to be easily cheated. And we kept close. A difficult matter it was, too, to keep this Mohican boy snug in the ambushment. Ah, Uncas, Uncas, your behavior was more like that of a curious woman than of a warrior on his scent. Uncas permitted his eyes to turn for an instant on the sturdy countenance of the speaker, but he neither spoke nor gave any indication of repentance. On the contrary, Hayward thought the manner of the young Mohican was disdainful, if not a little fierce, and that he suppressed passions that were ready to explode, as much in compliment to the listeners as from the deference he usually paid to his white associate. "'You saw our capture?' Hayward next demanded. "'We heard it,' was the significant answer. An Indian yell is plain language to men who have passed their days in the woods. But when you landed, we were driven to crawl like serpents beneath the leaves, and then we lost sight of you entirely, until we placed eyes on you again, trust to the trees, and ready bound for an Indian massacre. Our rescue was the deed of providence. It was nearly a miracle that you did not mistake the path, for the Hurons divided and each band had its horses. Aye, there we were thrown off the scent, and might, indeed, have lost the trail, had it not been for Uncas. We took the path, however, that led into the wilderness, for we judged, and judged rightly, that the savages would hold that course with their prisoners. But when we had followed it for many miles, without finding a single twig broken, as I had advised, my mind misgave me, especially as all the footsteps had the prints of moccasins. Our captors had the precaution to see us shod like themselves, said Duncan, raising a foot and exhibiting the buckskin he wore. Aye, t'was judgmatical, and like themselves, though we were too expert to be thrown from a trail by so common an invention. To what, then, are we indebted for our safety? To what, as a white man who has no taint of Indian blood, I should be ashamed to own, to the judgment of the young Mohican, in matters which I should know better than he, but which I can now hardly believe to be true, though my own eyes tell me it is so. "'Tis extraordinary! Will you not name the reason?' Uncas was bold enough to say that the beast ridden by the gentle ones, continued Hawkeye, glancing his eyes not without curious interest on the fillies of the ladies, planted the legs of one side on the ground at the same time, which is contrary to the movements of all trotting four-footed animals of my knowledge except the bear. And yet here are horses that always journey in this manner as my own eyes have seen, and as their trail has shown for twenty long miles. "'Tis the merit of the animal. They come from the shores of Narragansett Bay, in the small province of Providence Plantations, and are celebrated for their hardihood and the ease of this peculiar movement, though other horses are not unfrequently trained to the same. It may be, it may be, said Hawkeye, who had listened with singular attention to this explanation. Though I am a man who has the full blood of the whites, my judgment in deer and beaver is greater than in beast of burden. Major Effingham has many noble charges, but I have never seen one travel with such a siding gait. True, for he would value the animals for very different properties. Still is this a breed highly esteemed and, as you witness, much honored with the burdens it is often destined to bear. The Mohicans had suspended their operations about the glimmering fire to listen, 
and, when Duncan had done, they looked at each other significantly, the father uttering the never-failing exclamation of surprise. The scout ruminated, like a man digesting his newly acquired knowledge, and once more stole a glance at the horses. "'I dare say there are even stranger sights to be seen in the settlements,' he said at length. "'Nature is sadly abused by man when he once gets the mastery. "'But go, siding or go straight, Uncas has seen the movement, "'and their trail led us on to the broken bush. "'The elder branch knew the prince of one of the horses was bent upward, "'as a lady breaks a flower from its stem.' but all the rest were ragged and broken down, as if the strong hand of a man had been tearing them. So I concluded that the cunning varmints had seen the twig bent, and had torn the rest to make us believe a buck had been feeling the boughs with his antlers. I do believe your sagacity did not deceive you, for some such thing occurred. That was easy to see, added the scout, in no degree conscious of having exhibited any extraordinary sagacity, and a very different matter it was from a waddling horse. It then struck me the Mingos would push for this spring, for the knaves well know the virtue of its waters. It is then so famous, demanded Hayward examining with a more curious eye the secluded dell with its bubbling fountain, surrounded, as it was, by earth of a deep, dingy brown. Few redskins who travel south and east of the Great Lakes but have heard of its qualities. Will you taste for yourself? Hayward took the gourd, and after swallowing a little of the water, threw it aside with grimaces of discontent. The scout laughed in his silent but heartfelt manner, and shook his head with vast satisfaction. Ah, you want the flavor that one gets by habit. The time was when I liked it as little as yourself. But I have come to my taste, and I now crave it as a deer does the licks. Footnote. Many of the animals of the American forest resort to those spots where salt springs are found. These are called licks or salt licks, in the language of the country, for the circumstances that the quadruped is often obliged to lick the earth in order to obtain the saline particles. These licks are great places of resort with the hunters, who waylay their game near the paths that lead to them. End quote. Your high-spiced wines are not better liked than a redskin relishes this water especially when his nature is ailing. But Uncas has made his fire, and it is time we think of eating, for our journey is long, and all before us. Interrupting the dialogue by this abrupt transition, the scout had instant recourse to the fragments of food which had escaped the veracity of the Hurons. A very summary process completed the simple cookery, when he and the Mohicans commenced their humble meal with the silence and characteristic diligence of men who ate in order to enable themselves to endure great and unremitting toil. When this necessary and happily grateful duty had been performed, each of the foresters stooped and took a long and parting draught at that solitary and silent spring. Footnote. The scene of the foregoing incidents is on the spot where the village of Boston now stands one of the two principal watering-places of America. End footnote. Around which, and its sister fountains, within fifty years, the wealth, beauty, and talents of a hemisphere were to assemble in throngs, in pursuit of health and pleasure. Then Hawkeye announced his determination to proceed. The sisters resumed their saddles. Duncan and David grasped their rifles and followed on footsteps the scout leading the advance, and the Mohicans bringing up the rear. The whole party moved swiftly through the narrow path toward the north, leaving the healing waters to mingle unheeded with the adjacent brooks, and the bodies of the dead to fester on the neighboring mount. Without the rites of sepulchre, a fate 
but too common to the warriors of the woods, to excite either commiseration or comment. End of chapter 12 The Last of the Mohicans A Narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 13 Quote, I'll seek a readier path. Unquote. By Purnell. The route taken by Hawkeye lay across those sandy plains, relieved by occasional valleys and swells of land, which had been traversed by their party on the morning of the same day, with the baffled Magua for their guide. The sun had now fallen, low toward the distant mountains, and as their journey lay through the interminable forest, the heat was no longer oppressive. Their progress, in consequence, was proportionate, and long before the twilight gathered about them, they had made good many toilsome miles of their return. The hunter, like the savage whose place he filled, seemed to select among the blind signs of their wild route, with a species of instinct, seldom abating his speed, and never pausing to deliberate. A rapid and oblique glance at the moss of the trees, with an occasional upward gaze toward the setting sun, or a steady but passing look at the direction of the numerous watercourses through which he waded, were sufficient to determine his path and remove his greatest difficulties. In the meantime, the forest began to change its hues, losing that lively green which had embellished its arches in the graver light which is the usual precursor of the close of day. While the eyes of the sisters were endeavoring to catch glimpses through the trees of the flood of golden glory which formed a glittering halo around the sun, tinging here and there with ruby streaks or bordering with narrow edgings of shining yellow, a mass of clouds that lay piled at no great distance above the western hills, Hawkeye turned suddenly, and pointing toward the gorgeous heavens, he spoke. "'Yonder is the signal given to man to seek his food and natural rest,' he said. "'Better and wiser would it be if he could understand the signs of nature, and take a lesson from the fowls of the air and the beast of our field. Our night, however, will soon be over, for with the moon we must be up and moving again.' I remember to have fought the Maquas hereways in the first war in which I ever drew blood from a man, and we threw up a work of blocks to keep the ravenous varmints from handling our scalps. If my marks do not fail me, we shall find the place a few rods further to our left. Without waiting for an assent, or, indeed, for any reply, the sturdy hunter moved boldly into a dense thicket of young chestnuts shoving aside the branches of the exuberant shoots, which nearly covered the ground, like a man who expected at each step to discover some object he had formerly known. The recollection of the scout did not deceive him. After penetrating through the brush, matted as it was with briars for a few hundred feet, he entered an open space that surrounded a low green hillock which was crowned by the decayed blockhouse in question. This rude and neglected building was one of those deserted works, which, having been thrown up on an emergency, had been abandoned with the disappearance of danger, and was now quietly crumbling in the solitude of the forest, neglected and nearly forgotten, like the circumstances which had caused it to be reared. Such memorials of the passage and struggles of man are yet frequent throughout the broad barrier of wilderness, which once separated the hostile provinces, and form a species of ruins that are intimately associated with the recollections of colonial history, and which are in appropriate keeping with the gloomy character of the surrounding scenery. The roof of bark had long since fallen, and mingled with the soil, but the huge logs of pine, which had been hastily thrown together, still preserved their relative positions, though one angle of the work had given way under the pressure, and threatened a speedy downfall to the remainder of the rustic edifice. While Hayward and his companions hesitated to approach a building so decayed, Hawkeye and the Indians entered within the low walls, not only without fear, 
but with obvious interest. While the former surveyed the ruins, both internally and externally, with the curiosity of one whose recollections were reviving at each moment, Chingachgook related to his son in the language of the Delawares, and with the pride of a conqueror, the brief history of the skirmish which had been fought in his youth in that secluded spot. A strain of melancholy, however, blended with his triumph, rendering his voice, as usual, soft and musical. In the meantime, the sisters gladly dismounted and prepared to enjoy their halt in the coolness of the evening, and in a security which they believed nothing but the beast of the forest could invade. "'Would not our resting-place have been more retired, my worthy friend?' demanded the more vigilant Duncan, perceiving that the scout had already finished his short survey. "'Had we chosen a spot less known, and one more rarely visited than this?' "'Few live who know the blockhouse was ever raised,' was the slow, amusing answer. "'Tis not often that books are made, and narratives written, of such a scrimmage as was fought between the Mohicans and Mohawks in a war of their own waging. I was then a yonker, and went out with the Delawares, because I knowed they were a scandalized and wronged race. Forty days and forty nights did the imps crave our blood around this pile of logs, which I designed and partly reared. Being, as you'll remember, no Indian myself, but a man without a cross. The Delawares lent themselves to the work, and we made it good, ten to twenty, until our numbers were nearly equal, and then we sallied out upon the hounds, and not a man of them ever got back to tell the fate of his party. Yes, yes, I was then young and new to the sight of blood, and not relishing the thought that creatures who had spirits like myself should lay on the naked ground to be torn asunder by beast, or to bleach in the rains. I buried the dead with my own hands under that very little hillock where you have placed yourselves. And no bad seat does it make either, though it be raised by the bones of mortal men. Hayward and the sisters arose on the instant from the grassy sepulchre, nor could the two later, notwithstanding the terrific scenes they had so recently passed through, entirely suppress an emotion of natural horror when they found themselves in such familiar contact with the grave of the dead Mohawks. The gray light, the gloomy little area of dark grass, surrounded by its border of brush, beyond which the pines rose, in breathing silence, apparently into the very clouds, and the death-like stillness of the vast forest, were all in unison to deepen such a sensation. They are gone, and they are harmless, continued Hawkeye, waving his hand with a melancholy smile, at their manifest alarm. They'll never shout the war-hoop, nor strike a blow with the tomahawk again. And of all those who aided in placing them where they lie, Chingachgook and I only are living. The brothers and family of the Mohican formed our war-party, and you see before you all that are now left of his race. The eyes of the listeners involuntarily sought the forms of the Indians, with a compassionate interest in their desolate fortune. Their dark persons were still to be seen within the shadows of the blockhouse, the son listening on the relation of his father with that sort of intenseness which would be created by a narrative that redounded so much to the honor of those whose names he had long revered for their courage and savage virtues. "'I had thought the Delawares a Pacific people,' said Duncan." and that they never waged war in person, trusting the defense of their hands to those very Mohawks that you slew. "'Tis true, in part,' returned the scout, "'and yet at the bottom tis a wicked lie. Such a treaty was made in ages gone by through the deviltries of the Dutchers, who wished to disarm the natives that had the best right to the country where they had settled themselves. The Mohicans, though a part of the same nation, having to deal with the English, never entered into the silly bargain, but kept to their manhood, as in truth did the Delawares when their eyes were opened to their folly. You see before you a chief of the great Mohican Sagamores. Once his family could chase their deer 
over tracts of country wider than which belongs the Albany Pateroon, without crossing brook or hill that was not their own. But what is left of their descendant? He may find his six feet of earth when God chooses, and keep it in peace, perhaps, if he has a friend who will take the pains to sink his head so low that the plowshares cannot reach it. Enough, said Hayward, apprehensive that the subject might lead to a discussion that would interrupt the harmony so necessary to the preservation of his fair companions. We have journeyed far and few among us are blessed with forms like that of yours, which seems not to know neither fatigue nor weakness. The sinews and bones of a man carry me through it all, said the hunter, surveying his muscular limbs with a simplicity that betrayed the honest pleasure the compliment afforded him. There are larger and heavier men to be found in the settlements, but you might travel many days in a city, before you could meet one able to walk fifty miles without stopping to take breath, or who has kept the hounds within hearing during a chase of hours. However, as flesh and blood are not always the same, it is quite reasonable to suppose that the gentle ones are willing to rest after all they have seen and done this day. Uncas, clear out the spring while your father and I make a cover for their tender heads of these chestnut shoots and a bed of grass and leaves. The dialogue ceased, while the hunter and his companions busied themselves in preparations for the comfort and protection of those they guided, a spring which many long years before had induced the natives to select the place for their temporary fortification, was soon cleared of leaves, and a fountain of crystal gushed from the bed, diffusing its waters over the verdant hillock. A corner of the building was then roofed in such a manner as to exclude the heavy dew of the climate, and piles of sweet shrubs and dried leaves were laid beneath it for the sisters to repose on. While the diligent woodsmen were employed in this manner, Cora and Alice partook of that refreshment which duty required much more than inclination prompted them to accept. They then retired within the walls, and first offering up their thanksgiving for past mercies, and petitioning for continuance of the divine favor throughout the coming night, they laid their tender forms on the fragrant couch, and in spite of recollections and forebodings, soon sank into those slumbers which nature so imperiously demanded, and which were sweetened by hopes of the morrow. Duncan had prepared himself to pass the night in watchfulness near them, just without the ruin, but the scout, perceiving his intention, pointed toward Chingachgook, as he coolly disposed his own person on the grass, and said, The eyes of a white man are too heavy and too blind for such a watch as this. The Mohican will be our sentinel. Therefore let us sleep. I proved myself a sluggard on my post during the past night, said Hayward, and have less need of repose than you, who did more credit to the character of a soldier. Let all the party seek their rest, then, while I hold the guard. If we lay among the white tents of the sixtieth, and in front of an enemy like the French, I could not ask for a better watchman, returned the scout. But in the darkness and among the signs of the wilderness, your judgment will be like the folly of a child, and your vigilance thrown away. Do, then, like Uncas and myself, sleep, and sleep in safety. Hayward perceived, in truth, that the younger Indian had thrown his form on the side of the hillock while they were talking, like one who sought to make the most of the time allotted to rest, and that his example had been followed by David, whose voice literally clove to his jaws with the fever of his wound, heightened as it was by their toilsome march. Unwilling to prolong a useless discussion, the young man affected to comply, by posting his back against the logs of the blockhouse, in a half-recumbent posture, though resolutely determined in his own mind not to close an eye until he had delivered his precious charge into the arms of Monroe himself. Hawkeye, believing he had prevailed, soon fell asleep, and a silence as deep as the solitude in which they had found it pervaded the retired spot. 
For many minutes Duncan succeeded in keeping his senses on the alert, and alive to every moaning sound that arose from the forest. His vision became more acute as the shades of evening settled on the place, and even after the stars were glimmering above his head, he was able to distinguish the recumbent forms of his companions, as they lay stretched on the grass, and to note the person of Chingachgook, who sat upright and motionless as one of the trees which formed the dark barrier on every side. He still heard the breathings of the sisters, who lay within a few feet of him, and not a leaf was ruffled by the passing air of which his ear did not detect the whispering sound. At length, however, the mournful notes of a whippoorwill became blended with the moanings of an owl. His heavy eyes occasionally sought the bright rays of the stars, and he then fancied he saw them through the fallen lids. At instants of momentary wakefulness he mistook a bush for his associate sentinel. His head next sank upon his shoulder, which in its turn sought the support of the ground, and finally his whole person became relaxed and pliant, and the young man sank into a deep sleep, dreaming that he was a knight of ancient chivalry, holding his midnight vigils before the tent of a recaptured princess whose favor he did not despair of gaining by such a proof of devotion and watchfulness. How long the tired Duncan lay in this insensible state, he never knew himself. But his slumbering visions had been long lost in total forgetfulness when he was awakened by a light tap on the shoulder. Aroused by this signal, slight as it was, he sprang upon his feet with a confused recollection of the self-imposed duty he had assumed with the commencement of the night. "'Who comes?' he demanded, feeling for his sword at the place where it was usually suspended. "'Speak, friend or enemy?' "'Friend,' replied the low voice of Chingachgook, who, pointing upward at the luminary, which was shedding its mild light through the opening in the trees directly above their bivouac, immediately added in his rude English. Moon comes, and white man's fort, far, far off. Time to move, when sleep shuts both eyes of the Frenchman. You say true. Call up your friends, and bridle the horses, while I prepare my own companions for the march. We are awake, Duncan, said the soft silvery tones of Alice within the building, and ready to travel very fast after so refreshing a sleep. But you have watched through the tedious night in our behalf, after having endured so much fatigue the live-long day. Say, rather, I would have watched, but my treacherous eyes betrayed me. Twice have I proved myself unfit for the trust I bear. Nay, Duncan, deny it not, interrupted the smiling Alice issuing from the shadows of the building into the light of the moon, in all the loveliness of her fresh and beauty. I know you to be a heedless one, when self is the object of your care, but too vigilant in favor of others. Can we not tarry here a little longer, while you find the rest you need? Cheerfully, most cheerfully, will Cora and I keep the vigils, while you and all these brave men endeavor to snatch a little sleep if shame could cure me of my drowsiness i should never close an eye again said the uneasy youth gazing at the ingenuous countenance of alice where however in its sweet solicitude he read nothing to confirm his half-awakened suspicion it is but true that after leading you into danger by my heedlessness I have not even the merit of guarding your pillows, as should become a soldier. No one but Duncan himself should accuse Duncan of such a weakness. Go, then, and sleep. Believe me, neither of us weak girls as we are will betray our watch. The young man was relieved from the awkwardness of making any further protestations of his own demerits by an exclamation from Chingachgook and the attitude of riveted attention assumed by his son. "'The Mohicans hear an enemy,' whispered Hawkeye, who, by this time, in common with the whole party, was awake and stirring. "'They scent danger in the wind.' 
"'God forbid!' exclaimed Hayward. "'Surely we have had enough of bloodshed.' While he spoke, however, the young soldier seized his rifle, and advancing toward the front, prepared to atone for his venial remissness by freely exposing his life in defense of those he attended. "'Tis some creature of the forest, prowling around us, in quest of food," he said in a whisper, as soon as the low and apparently distant sounds which had startled the Mohicans reached his own ears. Psst! returned the attentive scout. "'Tis man. Even I can now tell his tread. Poor as my senses are when compared to an Indian's. That scampering Huron has fallen in with one of Montcalm's outlying parties, and they have struck upon our trail. I shouldn't like myself to spill more human blood in this spot, he added, looking around with anxiety in his features at the dim objects by which he was surrounded. But what must be, must. Lead the horses into the blockhouse. Uncas and friends, do you follow to the same shelter? Poor and old as it is, it offers a cover, and is rung with the crack of a rifle afore to-night. He was instantly obeyed, the Mohicans leading the Narragansetts within the ruin, whither the whole party repaired with the most guarded silence. The sound of approaching footsteps were now too distinctly audible to leave any doubts as to the nature of the interruption. They were soon mingled with voices calling to each other in an Indian dialect, which the hunter, in a whisper, affirmed to Hayward was the language of the Hurons. When the party reached the point where the horses had entered the thicket which surrounded the blockhouse, they were evidently at fault, having lost those mark which, until that moment, had directed their pursuit. It would seem by the voices that twenty men were soon collected at that one spot, mingling their different opinions and advice in noisy clamor. "'The knaves know our weaknesses,' whispered Hawkeye, who stood by the side of Hayward, in deep shade, looking through an opening in the logs. "'Or they wouldn't indulge their idleness in such a squall's march. Listen to the reptiles. Each man among them seems to have two tongues, and but a single leg. Duncan, brave as he was in the combat, could not, in such a moment of painful suspense, make any reply to the cool and characteristic remark of the scout. He only grasped his rifle more firmly, and fastened his eyes upon the narrow opening through which he gazed upon the moonlight view with increasing anxiety. The deeper tones of one who spoke as having authority were next heard, amid a silence that denoted the respect with which his orders, or rather advice, was received, after which, by the rustling of leaves and crackling of dried twigs, it was apparent that the savages were separating in pursuit of the lost trail. Fortunately for the pursued, the light of the moon, while it shed a flood of wild luster upon the little area about the ruin, was not sufficiently strong to penetrate the deep arches of the forest, where the objects still lay in deceptive shadow. The search proved fruitless, for so short and sudden had been the passage from the faint path the travelers had journeyed into the thicket, that every trace of their footsteps was lost in the obscurity of the woods. It was not long, however, before the restless savages were heard beating the brush, and gradually approaching the inner edge of that dense border of young chestnuts which encircled the little area. "'They are coming,' muttered Hayward, endeavoring to thrust his rifle through the chink in the logs. "'Let us fire upon their approach.' "'Keep everything in the shade,' returned the scout. "'The snapping of a flint, or even the smell of a single carnal of brimstone.' would bring the hungry varlets upon us in a body. Should it please God that we must give battle for the scalps, trust to the experience of men who know the ways of the savages, and who are not often backward when the war-hoop is howled. Duncan cast his eyes behind him, and saw that the trembling sisters were cowering in the far corner of the building, while the Mohicans stood in the shadow like two upright posts, ready 
and apparently willing, to strike when the blow should be needed. Curbing his impatience, he again looked out upon the area, and awaited the result in silence. At that instant the thicket opened, and a tall and armed Huron advanced a few paces into the open space. As he gazed upon the silent blockhouse, the moon fell upon his swarthy countenance, and betrayed its surprise and curiosity. He made the exclamation which usually accompanies the former emotion of an Indian, and, calling in a low voice, soon drew a companion to his side. These children of the woods stood together for several moments, pointing at the crumbling edifice, and conversing in the unintelligible language of their tribe. They then approached, though with slow and cautious steps, pausing every instant to look at the building, like startled deer whose curiosity struggled powerfully with their awakened apprehensions for the mastery. The foot of one of them suddenly rested on the mound, and he stopped to examine its nature. At this moment Hayward observed that the scout loosened his knife in its sheath, and lowered the muzzle of his rifle. Imitating these movements, the young man prepared himself for the struggle, which now seemed inevitable. The savages were so near that the least motion in one of the horses, or even a breath louder than common, would have betrayed the fugitives. But, in discovering the character of the mound, the attention of the Hurons appeared directed to a different object. They spoke together, and the sound of their voices were low and solemn, as if influenced by a reverence that was deeply blended with awe. Then they drew warily back, keeping their eyes riveted on the ruin, as if they expected to see the apparitions of the dead issue from its silent walls, until having reached the boundary of the area, they moved slowly into the thicket and disappeared. Hawkeye dropped the breech of his rifle to the earth, and drawing a long free breath, exclaimed in an audible whisper, Aye, they respect the dead, and it has this time saved their own lives, and it may be the lives of better men, too. Hayward lent his attention for a single moment to his companion, but without replying, he again turned toward those who had just then interested him more. He heard the two Hurons leave the bushes, and it was soon plain that all the pursuers were gathered about them, in deep attention of their report. After a few minutes of earnest and solemn dialogue, altogether different from the noisy clamor with which they had first collected about the spot, the sounds grew fainter and more distant, and finally were lost in the depths of the forest. Hawkeye waited until a signal from the listening Chinchkochkuk assured him that every sound from the retiring party was completely swallowed by the distance, when he motioned to Hayward to lead forth the horses and to assist the sisters into their saddles. The instant this was done, they issued through the broken gateway, and stealing out by a direction opposite to the one by which they entered, they quitted the spot, the sisters casting furtive glances at the silent grave and crumbling ruin, as they left the soft light of the moon to bury themselves in the gloom of the woods. End of chapter 13 The Last of the Mohicans A Narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 14 Quote, Qui est là? Puck. Paysan, pauvre Jean de France. Unquote. King Henry the Sixth. During the rapid movement from the blockhouse, and until the party was deeply buried in the forest, each individual was too much interested in the escape to hazard a word even in whispers. The scout resumed his post in advance, though his steps, after he had thrown a safe distance between himself and his enemies, were more deliberate than in their previous march, in consequence of his utter ignorance of the localities of the surrounding woods. More than once he halted to consult with his confederates, the Mohicans, pointing upward at the moon and examining the barks of the trees with care. In these brief pauses, 
Hayward and the sisters listened, with senses rendered doubly acute by the danger, to detect any symptoms which might announce the proximity of their foes. At such moments it seemed as if the vast range of country lay buried in eternal sleep, not the least sound arising from the forest, unless it was the distant and scarcely audible rippling of a watercourse. Birds, beast, and man appeared to slumber alike, if indeed any of the latter were to be found in that wide tract of wilderness. But the sounds of the rivulet, feeble and murmuring as they were, relieved the guides at once from no trifling embarrassment, and toward it they immediately held their way. When the banks of the little stream were gained, Hawkeye made another halt, and taking the moccasins from his feet, he invited Hayward and Gamut to follow his example. He then entered the water, and for near an hour they traveled in the bed of the brook, leaving no trail. The moon had already sunk into an immense pile of black clouds, which lay impending above the western horizon, when they issued from the low and devious water course to rise again to the light and the level of the sandy but wooded plain. Here the scouts seemed to be once more at home, for he held on his way with the certainty and the diligence of a man who moved in the security of his own knowledge. The path soon became more uneven, and the travelers could plainly perceive that the mountains drew nigher to them on each hand, and that they were, in truth, about entering one of their gorges. Suddenly Hawkeye made a pause, and waiting until he was joined by the whole party, he spoke, though in tones so low and cautious that they added to the solemnity of his words in the quiet and darkness of the place. It is easy to know the pathways and to find the licks and water courses of the wilderness, he said, but who that saw this spot could venture to say that a mighty army was at rest among yonder silent trees and barren mountains? We are then at no great distance from William Henry, said Hayward, advancing nigher to the scout. It is yet a long and weary path, and when and where to strike it is now our greatest difficulty. See, he said, pointing through the trees toward a spot where a little basin of water reflected the stars from its placid bosom. Here is the bloody pond, and I am on ground that I have not only often traveled, but over which I have fought the enemy from the rising to the setting of the sun. Ha! That sheet of dull and dreary water, then, is the sepulchre of the brave men who fell in the contest. I have heard it named, but never have I stood on its banks before. Three battles we did make with the Dutch Frenchmen in a day, continued Hawkeye, pursuing the train of his own thoughts rather than replying to the remark of Duncan. Footnote. Baron de Scal, a German, in the service of France. A few years previously to the period of the tale, this officer was defeated by Sir William Johnson of Johnstown, New York, on the shores of Lake George. End footnote. He met us hard by in our outward march to ambush his advance, and scattered us like driven deer through the defile to the shores of Horican. Then we rallied behind our fallen trees, and made head against him, under Sir William, who was made Sir William for that very deed. And well did we pay him for the disgrace of the morning. Hundreds of Frenchmen saw the sun that day for the last time, and even their leader, Descau himself, fell into our hands, so cut and torn with the lead that he has gone back to his own country, unfit for further acts in war. "'Twas a noble repulse!' exclaimed Hayward in the heat of his youthful ardor. "'The fame of it reached us early in our southern army.' "'Aye, but it did not end there. "'I was sent by Major Effingham at Sir William's own bidding "'to outflank the French "'and carry the tidings of their disaster across the portage "'to the fort on the Hudson. "'Just here away where you see the trees rise into a mountain swell.' I met a party coming down to our aid, and I led them where the enemy were taking their meal, little dreaming that they had not finished the bloody work of the day. And you surprised them? 
if death can be a surprise to men who are thinking only of the cravings of their appetites, we gave them but little breathing time, for they had borne hard upon us in the fight of the morning, and there were few in our party who had not lost friend or relative by their hands. When all was over, the dead, and some say the dying, were cast into that little pond. These eyes have seen its waters colored with blood as natural water never yet flowed from the bowels of the earth. It was a convenient, and I trust will prove a peaceful grave for a soldier. You have then seen much service on this frontier? I said the scout, erecting his tall person with an air of military pride. There are not many echoes among these hills that haven't rung with the crack of my rifle, nor is there the space of a square mile atwixt the hurricane and the river that Kildare hasn't dropped the living body on, be it an enemy or be it a brute beast. As for the grave there being as quiet as you mention, it is another matter. There are them in the camp who say and think, man, to lie still, should not be buried, while the breath is in the body. And certain it is that in the hurry of that evening, the doctors had but little time to say who was living and who was dead. Hist! See you nothing walking on the shore of the pond? Tis not probable that any are as houseless as ourselves in this dreary forest, such as he may care but little for house or shelter, and night dew can never wet a body that passes its days in the water, returned the scout, grasping the shoulder of Hayward with such convulsive strength as to make the young soldier painfully sensible how much superstitious terror had got the mastery of a man usually so dauntless. By heaven, there is a human form, and it approaches. Stand to your arms, my friends, for we know not whom we encounter. Qui vive? demanded a stern, quick voice which sounded like a challenge from another world, issuing out from that solitary and solemn place. "'What says it?' whispered the scout. "'It speaks neither Indian nor English.' "'Qui vive?' repeated the same voice, which was quickly followed by the rattling of arms and a menacing attitude. "'France!' cried Hayward, advancing from the shadow of the trees to the shore of the pond, within a few yards of the sentinel. "'D'où venez-vous?' Où allez-vous, dieu si bonheur? demanded the grenadier, in the language and the accent of a man from old France. Je vends de la découverte, et je vais me coucher. Êtes-vous officier du roi? Sans doute, mon camarade. Mais prends tu pour un provincial? Je suis capitaine de chasseur. Hayward well knew that the other was a regiment of the line. J'ai ici, avec moi, le fil du commandant de la fortification. Aha, tu en es centen du palais. Je l'ai a fait prisonnier, pré à la foi, et je l'ai conduit à général. Ma foi, madame, j'en suis fâché pour vous, exclaimed the young soldier, touching his cap with grace. Ma fortune de guerre, vous trouverez notre général un brave homme et bien poli avec la dame. C'est le caractère des gens de guerre, said Cora, with admirable self-possession. Adieu, mon ami, je vous souhaiterai un devoir. The soldier made a low and humble acknowledgment for her civility, and Hayward adding a Bon nuit, mon camarade, they moved deliberately forward, leaving the sentinel pacing the banks of the silent pond, little suspecting an enemy of so much effrontery, and humming to himself those words which were recalled to his mind by the sight of women, and perhaps by recollections of his own distant and beautiful friends. Vive le vent, vive l'amour, etc., etc. Tis well you understood the knave, whispered the scout, when they had gained a little distance from the place, and letting his rifle fall into the hollow of his arm again. I soon saw that he was one of them uneasy Frenchers, and well for him it was that his speech was friendly and his wishes kind, or a place might have been found for his bones among those of his countrymen. He was interrupted by a long and heavy groan, which arose from the little basin, as though in truth the spirits of the departed lingered about their watery sepulchre. Surely it was flesh, continued the scout. No spirit could handle its arm so steadily. It was a flesh, but whether the poor fellow still belongs to this world may well be doubted. 
said Hayward, glancing his eyes around him and missing Chingachgook from their little band. Another groan, more faint than the former, was succeeded by a heavy and sullen plunge into the water, and all was still again, as if the borders of the dreary pool had never been awakened from the silence of creation. While they yet hesitated in uncertainty, the form of the Indian was seen gliding out of the thicket. As the chief rejoined them, with one hand he attached the reeking scalp of the unfortunate young Frenchman to his girdle, and with the other he replaced the knife and tomahawk that had drunk his blood. He then took his wanted station with the air of a man who believed he had done a deed of merit. The scout dropped one end of his rifle to the earth, and leaning his hands on the other, he stood musing in profound silence. Then shaking his head in a mournful manner, he muttered, "'Twould have been a cruel and unhuman act for a white skin, but tis the gift and nature of an Indian, and I suppose it should not be denied. I could wish, though, it had befallen an accursed Mingo, rather than that gay young boy from the old countries. Enough, said Hayward, apprehensive the unconscious sisters might comprehend the nature of the detention, and conquering his disgust by a train of reflections very much like that of the hunter. Tis done, and though better it were left undone, cannot be amended. You see, we are too obviously within the sentinels of the enemy. What course do you propose to follow? Yes, said Hawkeye, rousing himself again. Tis as you say. Too late to harbor further thoughts about it. I, the French, have gathered around the fort in good earnest, and we have a delicate needle to thread in passing them. And but little time to do it in, added Hayward, glancing his eyes upwards toward the bank of vapor that concealed the setting moon. And little time to do it in, repeated the scout. The thing may be done in two fashions, by the help of providence, without which it may not be done at all. Name them quickly, for time presses. One would be to dismount the gentle ones, and let their beast range the plain. By sending the Mohicans in front, we might then cut a lane through their sentries, and enter the fort over the dead bodies. It will not do. It will not do interrupted the generous Hayward. A soldier might force his way in this manner, but never with such a convoy. T'would be, indeed, a bloody path for such tender feet to wade in, returned the equally reluctant scout. But I thought it befitting my manhood to name it. We must then turn in our trail and get without the line of their lookouts, when we will bend short to the west and enter the mountains where I can hide you so that the devil's hounds in Montcalm's pay will be thrown off the scent for months to come. Let it be done, and that instantly. Further words were unnecessary, for Hawkeye, merely uttering the mandate to follow, moved along the route by which they had just entered, their present critical and even dangerous situation. Their progress, like their late dialogue, was guarded, and without noise, for none knew at what moment a passing patrol or a crouching picket of the enemy might rise upon their path. As they held their silent way along the margin of the pond, again Hayward and the scout stole furtive glances at its appalling dreariness. They looked in vain for the form they had so recently seen stalking along in silent shores, while a low and regular wash of the little waves by announcing that the waters were not yet subsided, furnished a frightful memorial of the deed of blood they had just witnessed. Like all that passing and gloomy scene, the low basin, however, quickly melted in the darkness, and became blended with the mass of black objects in the rear of the travelers. Hawkeye soon deviated from the line of their retreat, and striking off towards the mountains which form the western boundary of the narrow plain, he led his followers with swift steps, deep within the shadows that were cast from their high and broken summits. The route was now painful, lying over ground ragged with rocks, 
and intersected with ravines, and their progress proportionately slow. Bleak and black hills lay on every side of them, compensating in some degree for the additional toil of the march by the sense of security they imparted. At length the party began slowly to rise a steep and rugged ascent by a path that curiously wound among rocks and trees, avoiding the one and supported by the other, in a manner that showed it had been devised by men long practiced in the arts of the wilderness. As they gradually rose from the level of the valleys, the thick darkness which usually precedes the approach of day began to disperse, and objects were seen in the plain and palpable colors with which they had been gifted by nature. When they issued from the stunted woods which clung to the barren sides of the mountain, upon a flat and mossy rock that formed its summit, they met the morning as it came blushing above the green pines of a hill that lay on the opposite side of the valley of the Horican. The scout now told the sisters to dismount, and taking the bridles from the mouths and the saddles off the backs of the jaded beast, he turned them loose to glean a scanty subsistence among the shrubs and meager herbage of that elevated region. Go, he said, and seek your food where nature gives it to you and beware that you become not food to ravenous wolves yourselves among these hills. "'Have we no further need of them?' demanded Hayward. "'See and judge with your own eyes,' said the scout, advancing toward the eastern brow of the mountain, whither he beckoned for the whole party to follow. If it was as easy to look into the heart of man as it is to spy out the nakedness of Montcalm's camp from this spot, hypocrites would grow scarce.' and the cunning of a Mingo might prove a losing game compared to the honesty of a Delaware. When the travelers reached the verge of the precipices, they saw at a glance the truth of the scout's declaration and the admirable foresight with which he had led them to their commanding station. The mountain on which they stood, elevated perhaps a thousand feet in the air, was a high cone that rose a little in advance of that range which stretches for miles along the western shores of the lake, until meeting its sisters miles beyond the water, it ran off toward the Canadas in confused and broken masses of rock, thinly sprinkled with evergreens. Immediately at the feet of the party, the southern shore of the Horican swept in a broad semicircle from mountain to mountain, making a wide strand that soon rose into an uneven and somewhat elevated plain. To the north stretched the limpid, and as it appeared from that dizzy height, the narrow sheet of the holy lake, indented with numberless bays, embellished by fantastic headlands, and dotted with countless islands. At the distance of a few leagues, the bed of the water became lost among mountains, or was wrapped in the masses of vapor, that came slowly rolling along their bosom, before a light morning air. But... A narrow opening between the crest of the hills pointed out the passage by which they found their way still further north, to spread their pure and ample sheets again before pouring out their tribute into the distant Champlain. To the south stretched the defile or rather broken plain so often mentioned. For several miles in this direction the mountains appeared reluctant to yield their dominion, but within reach of the eye they diverged and finally melted into the level and sandy lands, across which we have accompanied our adventurers in their double journey. Along both ranges of hills which bounded the opposite sides of the lake and valley, clouds of light vapor were rising in spiral wreaths from the uninhabited woods, looking like the smoke of hidden cottages, or rolled lazily down the declivities to mingle with the fogs of the lower land. A single solitary snow-white cloud floated above the valley, and marked the spot beneath which lay the silent pool of the bloody pond. Directly on the shore of the lake, and nearer to its western than its eastern margin, lay the extensive earthen ramparts and low buildings of William Henry. Two of the sweeping bastions appeared to rest on the water, which washed their bases, while a deep ditch and extensive morasses guarded its other sides and angles. The land had been cleared of wood for a reasonable distance around the work, 
but every other part of the scene lay in the green livery of nature, except where the limpid water mellowed the view, or the bold rocks thrust their black and naked heads above the undulating outline of the mountain ranges. In this front might be seen the scattered sentinels, who held a weary watch against their numerous foes, and within the walls themselves the travelers looked down upon men still drowsy with a night of vigilance. Toward the southeast, but in immediate contact with the fort, was an entrenched camp, posted on a rocky eminence that would have been far more eligible for the work itself, in which Hawkeye pointed out the presence of those auxiliary regiments that had so recently left the Hudson in their company. From the woods a little further to the south rose numerous dark and lurid smokes, which were easily to be distinguished from the purer exaltations of the springs, and which the scout also showed to Hayward, as evidences that the enemy lay in force in that direction. But the spectacle which most concerned the young soldier was on the western bank of the lake, though quite near to its southern termination. On a strip of land which appeared from this stand too narrow to contain such an army, but which in truth extended many hundreds of yards from the shores of the Horican to the base of the mountain, were to be seen the white tents and military engines of an encampment of ten thousand men. Batteries were already thrown up in their front, and even while the spectators above them were looking down, with such different emotions, on a scene which lay like a map beneath their feet, the roar of artillery rose from the valley and passed off in thundering echoes along the eastern hills. "'Morning is just touching them below,' said the deliberate and musing scout, "'and the watchers have a mind to wake up the sleepers by the sound of cannon. "'We are a few hours too late. "'Montcalm has already filled the woods with his accursed Iroquois.' "'The place is indeed invested,' returned Duncan. "'But is there no expedient by which we may enter? "'Capture in the works would be far preferable to falling again into the hands of roving Indians.' "'See!' exclaimed the scout, unconsciously directing the attention of Cora to the quarters of her own father. How that shot has made the stones fly from the side of the commandant's house? Aye, these Frenchers will pull it to pieces faster than it was put together, solid and thick though it be. Hayward, I sickened at the sight of danger that I cannot share, said the undaunted but anxious daughter. Let us go to Montcalm and demand admission. He dare not deny a child the boon. You would scarce find the tent of the Frenchman with the hair on your head, said the blunt scout. If I had but one of the thousand boats which lie among that shore, it might be done. Ha! Here will soon be an end of the firing, for yonder comes a fog that will turn day to night, and make an Indian arrow more dangerous than a molded cannon. Now, if you are equal to the work and will follow, I will make a push, for I long to get down into the camp, if it be only to scatter some Mingo dogs that I see lurking in the skirts of yonder thicket of birch. We are equal, said Cora firmly. On such an errand we will follow to any danger. The scout turned to her with a smile of honest and cordial approbation, as he answered, I would I had a thousand men of brawny limbs and quick eyes that fear death as little as you. I'd send them jabbering Frenchers back into their den again, afore the week was ended, howling like so many fettered hounds or hungry wolves. But, sir, he added, turning from her to the rest of the party, the fog comes rolling down so fast, we shall have but just the time to meet it on the plain, and use it as a cover. Remember, if any accident should befall me, to keep the air blowing on your left cheeks, or rather, follow the Mohicans. They'd sent their way, be it in day or be it at night. He then waved his hand for them to follow, and threw himself down the steep declivity with free but careful footsteps. Hayward assisted the sisters to descend, and in a few minutes they were all far down a mountain, whose sides they had climbed with so much toil and pain. The direction taken by Hawkeye soon brought the travelers to the level of the plain, 
nearly opposite to a sally-port in the western curtain of the fort, which lay itself at the distance of about half a mile from the point where he halted to allow Duncan to come up with his charge. In their eagerness, and favored by the nature of the ground, they had anticipated the fog which was rolling heavily down the lake, and it became necessary to pause until the mist had wrapped the camp of the enemy in their fleecy mantle. The Mohicans profited by the delay to steal out of the woods and to make a survey of surrounding objects. They were followed at a little distance by the scout, with a view to profit early by their report, and to obtain some faint knowledge for himself of the more immediate localities. In a very few moments he returned, his face reddened with vexation, while he muttered his disappointment in words of no very gentle import. "'Here has the cunning Frenchman been posting a picket, directly in our path,' he said. "'Redskins and whites, and we shall be as likely to fall into their midst as to pass them in the fog. "'Cannot we make a circuit to avoid the danger?' asked Hayward. "'And come into our path again, when it is past? "'Who that once bends from the line of his march in a fog can tell when he or how to find it again?' The mist of Horican are not like the curls of a peace pipe, or the smoke which settles above a mosquito fire. He was yet speaking when a crashing sound was heard, and a cannonball entered the thicket, striking the body of a sapling and rebounding to the earth, its force much expended by previous resistance. The Indians followed instantly, like busy attendants on the terrible messenger, and Uncas commenced speaking earnestly and with much action in the Delaware tongue. "'It may be so, lad,' muttered the scout when he had ended, "'for desperate fevers are not to be treated like a toothache. "'Come, then. The fog is shutting in.' "'Stop!' cried Hayward. First, explain your expectations.' "'Tis soon done, and a small hope it is, "'but it is better than nothing. "'This shot that you see,' added the scout, kicking the harmless iron with his foot, has ploughed the earth in its road from the fort, and we shall hunt for the furrow it has made when all other signs may fail. No more words, but follow, or the fog may leave us in the middle of our path, a mark for both armies to shoot at. Hayward, perceiving that, in fact, a crisis had arrived, when acts were more required than words, placed himself between the sisters, and drew them swiftly forward, keeping the dim figure of their leader in his eye. It was soon apparent that Hawkeye had not magnified the power of the fog, for before they had proceeded twenty yards, it was difficult for the different individuals of the party to distinguish each other in the vapor. They had made their little circuit to the left, and were already inclining again toward the right, having, as Hayward thought, got over nearly half the distance to the friendly works when his ears were saluted with the fierce summons apparently within twenty feet of them of, Give up! Push on, whispered the scout, once more bending to the left. Push on, repeated Hayward, when the summons was renewed by a dozen voices, each of which seemed charged with menace. C'est moi, cried Duncan, dragging rather than leading those he supported swiftly onward. Bet, qui moi? Abbe de la France. Two bus plus later, do an enemy de la France. Are au podu, j'ai te fait, ami du diable. Non, four camarade, four. The order was instantly obeyed, and the fog was stirred by the explosion of fifty muskets. Happily, the aim was bad, and the bullets cut the air in a direction a little different from that taken by the fugitives. Though still so nigh them, that to the unpractised ears of David and the two females, it appeared as if they whistled within a few inches of the organs. The outcry was renewed, and the order not only to fire again but to pursue was too plainly audible. When Hayward briefly explained the meaning of the words they heard, Hawkeye halted and spoke with quick decision and great firmness. Let us deliver our fire, he said. They will believe it a sortie and give way, or they will wait for reinforcements. The scheme was well conceived, but failed in its effects. 
the instant the French heard the pieces, it seemed as if the plain was alive with men, muskets rattling along its whole extent, from the shores of the lake to the furthest boundary of the woods. "'We shall draw their entire army upon us, and bring on a general assault,' said Duncan. "'Lead on, my friend, for your own life and ours.' The scout seemed willing to comply, but in the hurry of the moment, and in the change of position, he had lost the direction. In vain he turned either cheek toward the light air. They felt equally cool. In this dilemma, Uncas lighted on the furrow of the cannonball, where it had cut the ground in three adjacent anthills. "'Give me the range,' said Hawkeye, bending to catch a glimpse of the direction, and then instantly moving onward. Cries, oaths, voices calling to each other, and the reports of muskets which were now quick and incessant, and apparently on every side of them. Suddenly a strong glare of light flashed across the scene. The fog rolled upward in thick wreaths, and several cannons belched across the plain, and the roar was thrown heavily back from the bellowing echoes of the mountain. "'Tis from the fort!' exclaimed Hawkeye, turning short on his tracks. "'And we, like stricken fools, were rushing to the woods under the very knives of the Maquas. The instant their mistake was rectified, the whole party retraced the error with the utmost diligence. Duncan willingly relinquished the support of Cora to the arm of Uncas, and Cora as readily accepted the welcome assistance. Men, hot and angry in pursuit, were evidently on their footsteps, and each instant threatened their capture, if not their destruction. Ponte cantia, uncle cried an eager pursuer, who seemed to direct the operations of the enemy. "'Stand firm, and be ready, my gallant sixtieth. suddenly exclaimed the voice above them. "'Wait to see the enemy. Fire low, and sweep the glossies.' "'Father! Father!' exclaimed a piercing cry from out the mist. "'It is high, Alice! Thine own Elsie! Spare! Oh, save your daughters!' "'Hold!' shouted the former speaker in the awful tones of paternal agony, the sound reaching even to the woods, and rolling back in solemn echo. "'Tis she! God has restored me to my children! Throw open the sally-port in the field, sixtieths! To the field! Pull not a trigger, lest ye kill my lambs! Drive off these dogs of France with your steel!' Duncan heard the grating of the rusty hinges, and, darting to the spot directed by the sound, he met a long line of dark red warriors passing swiftly toward the glossies. He knew them from his own battalion of the Royal Americans, and flying to their head, soon swept every trace of his pursuers from before the works. For an instant, Cor and Alice stood trembling and bewildered by this unexpected desertion, but before either had leisure for speech, or even thought, an officer of gigantic frame, whose locks were bleached with years of service, but whose air of military grandeur had been rather softened than destroyed by time, rushed out of the body of mist and folded them to his bosom, while large scalding tears rolled down his pale and wrinkled cheeks, and he exclaimed in the peculiar accent of Scotland, For this I thank thee, Lord. Let danger come as it will. Thy servant is now prepared. End chapter 14